my first grader comes to me the other day, and he says, Dad, I want to build a catapult. But not just any catapult. We're talking like a full-size, big as my first grader trebuchet, painted green to look just like a dragon, breathing fire, capable of launching a piece of fruit across an entire football field. He's got schematic designs, plans for all the paint. He's asking about using a miter saw and a circular saw. He wants to go down to Lowe's, very excited. And I had to slow him down for a second. I said, Benny, what are you going to use your catapult for? I'm not sure he had thought that far ahead yet. I could really see those wheels turning. He's trying to come up with an answer. And this big smile spreads across his face, and he says, We'll see. So can we? Now, like any responsible parent, let me back up. Like any dad, my response was, Sure, buddy. Let's do it. I'm in. I am all in. It's two words. It's just two words. All in. But I believe those two words can have a greater impact on a student's ability to achieve success than any piece of curriculum, instruction, wisdom, or insight I can give them in a classroom. All in. But before we can understand the impact those two words can have, we need to start with dreams. Every day, we invite our students to dream with us. We hope that in sharing that dream, that we foster a relationship, we build a connection, we spark their imagination. But how often are we listening to their dreams? When they ask us to dream with us, what is our response? Today, I really want you to consider your response. Because when a student asks you to dream with them, what they're really doing is asking a question. About 15 years ago, a brilliant innovator, a genius, an engineer, had an idea he believed would revolutionize the world. But try as much as he could, he could not solve his initial problem. The technology did not exist. He had a brilliant dream, an idea, a question, but it went unanswered. He gave up on a routine business visit to Toshiba, which supplied parts for his company. He was talking with the engineers offhandedly after the meeting, and they pulled out a prototyped 1.8-inch hard drive. Now, at the time, this was an incredible accomplishment, but had zero practical application. In fact, Toshiba had no idea what to do with it. They showed it to him thinking, he's a smart guy, maybe he has an idea. That innovator was instantly excited. This was the answer to his question. He ran with it. And by the fall of 2000, he was able to answer a question. How can we take large amounts of information but store on a device small enough we could slip it in our front pocket? In that fall of 2000, Steve Jobs introduced the very first iPod, forever revolutionizing the way that we collect, maintain, and enjoy our music collections. All innovators, all innovation starts with a big question like that. And that question can seem impossible. It could seem unlikely, foolish even. But they had the courage to answer the question, and more importantly, the courage to find the How can the power of 3D printing be harnessed to create medicine when and where it is needed? How can the advancements in nanotechnology be used to fight and prevent disease? These are some pretty heavy questions, profound questions. If you asked those 10 years ago, impossible. If you asked them five years ago, unlikely. Today, well, they're very possible. Five or 10 years from today, those questions probably will be answered. Maybe why one of you sitting here today but I wonder sometimes, when we hear those big questions, those questions that lead to the invention of an iPod, those questions from 21st century leaders in medicine, I wonder, is there another question we're missing altogether? Inside of those bigger questions, is there a more important question, a cardinal question 
that is embedded within? I think there has to be. You know, these questions aren't offered up to the cosmos. They're not rhetorical. They're not meant to fall on deaf ears. All brilliant questions are asked with the intention they will be answered. So there must be an audience. Maybe we are that audience. Maybe we are being the ones that are asked to dream, to look at something in a new way, to change something, to create something, to imagine something the world has never seen before. We're being asked these profound questions, but maybe what we're really being asked is, will you help me answer this question? Will you dream with me? Will you dream with me? You know, when our students share a dream with us or an idea with us, when a student asks us to dream with them, I hope that we hear that cardinal question within. Will you dream with me? And I hope our answer is, yes, I'm in. I'm all in. But what does that mean, to be all in? For those of us that choose to dream with our students, how do we be all in? I think we know what it means when we take a look at the world of sports. And when you study sports and what it means to be all in for a team, I think there are three clear themes that rise to the top that can help us better as educators to dream with our students. One, we need to begin at the end. Two, we need to recognize there is a larger team around us. And three, we need to be willing to take risks. How do we begin at the end? Above all individual accolades, individual success, the ideal conclusion to any sports season is a championship. That ability to stand on a podium and hold that trophy high above your head, victorious. You know, after the fact, the athletes will tell you they got to that point because they visualized their championship moment from the beginning of the season. They started at the end and thought, what can I do to hold that trophy? And then moving backwards, they considered every opportunity as an opportunity to make a championship decision, as an opportunity for greatness. Could they make the right decision at every moment to put themselves in a position to win? They weren't spending time considering per-game statistics. How they're going to rank against their peers. What individual awards will they receive at the end of the season? Instead, they visualized their team in that championship moment. I wonder how often do we see our students at the end? How often during the day do you visualize your student walking across the podium to receive their diploma? What dreams do they carry with them, realized, unrealized? Are you visualizing their championship moment? Or are we caught up in today? We allot minutes every day for reading. We allot minutes every day for math. We have minutes every day to practice for standardized tests. We have minutes for practice tests for standardized tests. All of these minutes are added up to give us that snapshot in time, that snapshot in the present moment. But are we losing sight, losing sight of that championship moment? We can't. In 2013, the U.S. Department of Labor put out a study that showed 65% of our students will hold a job that does not exist when they leave college. 65%. How are we going to prepare them for jobs that do not exist if we're only focusing on those minutes of today? How do we prepare them to answer those questions from those 21st century leaders of innovation if we're not taking time today to focus on that championship moment, to look long-term beyond the minutes? Can we know our answer will be all in when a student asks us to dream with them, knowing all in is to answer a question that hasn't been asked. All in can mean answering a question for a job that doesn't exist. If we're asked to dream with them beyond scripted curriculum, can we be all in? Beyond the minutes of today, are we all in? 
we also have to recognize there is a larger team that is around us. Lake Placid, New York, the year is 1980. It's a story we all know, but it's a story we love. A group of college hockey players, not destined to be stars in the National Hockey League, had the Herculean task of facing the mighty USSR in a semifinal match, hoping for a gold medal. Absolutely an underdog. And in fact, it was a surprise when they took a 4-3 lead with 10 minutes left to go. Sometimes a dream is not enough. Sometimes just visualizing that championship moment is not enough. We need a team. And that team doesn't have to be just you, just you and one student. That team can mean so much more. In sports, when a team is making their medal push or their championship push, it's not just the players asked to be all in. It's coaches, trainers, ball boys, announcers, a city, a nation. Record numbers turned in to watch that game in 1980. People that had never watched a game of hockey in their life. For them, U.S. versus USSR wasn't just a game. It was a battle of ideology in the height of the Cold War. They were asked to all be a part of that moment. After the game, tens of thousands of people flocked to the streets, singing God Bless America, honking their car horns. The U.S. team was badly outmatched. They knew they didn't have much of a chance, but they asked all of us to be in. They asked us to be all in, to believe in their dream, to believe in their miracle. And when those seconds counted down, the play-by-play man, Al Michaels, answered for all of us, do you believe in miracles? Yes. He could just have easily said, do you believe in miracles? We're all in. An entire nation was leveraged to be all in at that moment. How do we leverage the community around us? Do we give our students opportunities to work with their peers, parents, volunteers, other teachers, people outside of their own doors? We live and work in a metropolitan area of three million people. Are you leveraging their resources? Will you leverage their skills? What can we do tomorrow to leverage their strengths, to make even that one connection with our student that's going to help them achieve their championship moment. Our team extends beyond these walls. Our team extends beyond the six and a half hours a day they're sitting in our classroom. As a team of dreamers, are you all in? And finally, we need to take risks. At 21 years old, a junior in college, John Schneider wrote a letter to the general manager of the Green Bay Packers begging for a job. So impressed by his tenacity, the GM gave him a position as an intern. That internship blossomed into a 17-year journey through five NFL teams. He developed a reputation as a forward thinker and a risk taker, so much so that it was a huge surprise when he was given a 5-11 and team of his own, a team marked by 40 years of mediocrity. But he had a dream. He had a clear vision in mind. He didn't want conventional. He believed that a player's own dreams of greatness, a a player's own dreams to overcome obstacles, a player's willingness to take risks, a player's willingness to sacrifice personal statistics for team success were more important than those conventional measurables used to design and build a football team. He believed in it so much that that first year, he made over 250 player transactions, a move widely criticized by the league. But he wanted to find those players that fit that mold, willing to share in that dream, to dream with him. He believed in it so much that the next year, he drafted a defensive back who was five inches too big. The year after that, he drafted a quarterback that was five inches too short. A year after that, John Schneider's Seattle Seahawks won their first title in franchise history. He took a lot of risks, made moves that were unconventional, but those risks were rewarded. Sometimes what our students ask us to do, 
sometimes students' dreams are not conventional. They ask us for resources we don't have. They ask us questions we can't answer. They ask us to look at something in a way that we've never looked at before, something truly unconventional. But why not you? You know, we ask our students to take risks because we recognize that powerful potential for growth, what they can become when they take risks. So why don't we take risks too? How can we possibly ask our students to answer those questions from 21st century innovators? How can we possibly ask our students to be ready for jobs that don't exist if we are only willing to work within our minutes of the day, if we are only willing to share with them what is conventional, if we can only share with them what we are comfortable right now explaining? We need to move beyond that. We need to match that growth mindset from our students. You know, a student's default setting, they like to make, they like to create, they like to tinker, explore, take risks. Their default setting is all in. Can we match our students for their sake and be all in? There's countless examples of innovators, of innovation, not just the world of sports or the world of technology or the world of education, all around us. And they began with a big idea, a dream, really a question. I want to go back to those two questions from our 21st century leaders. How do we harness the power of 3D printing? How do we harness the power of nanotechnology? Create medicine when and where it is needed that nanotechnology to fight and prevent illnesses? These are some radical questions, profound questions. But what's really being asked is for us to dream with them. How do we prepare our students to answer those questions if we can't be all in right now? And we have to be all in right now. Because if you look a little bit deeper, those 21st century leaders are sitting in your classroom. Those 21st century leaders are asking those questions of tomorrow, asking us to dream with them. And if you look deeper still, they're not just asking about medicine. They're not just asking about technology. What they're really asking is, will you dream with me? I don't know how to answer their questions today. I don't know what we will discover. I don't know who's going to join our team on this journey. I don't know what risks will shape our tomorrow, but I can see their championship moment, and I'm all in. Are you? Thank you.